27 foreign ministers attended it. Of course, there were two ministers of state. As India hosts its first Big Bang G20 meeting, Prime Minister Narendra Modi had a video message for the G20 foreign ministers, and he called upon the G20 countries to build consensus on pressing global challenges and not allow their differences on geopolitical tensions to affect the overall cooperation. This, as the shadow of the Russia-Ukraine war looms large on this summit. Prime Minister Narendra Modi urged the foreign ministers to find common ground on divisive issues. Let there be more issues of commonality than divisions and build on that commonality. This, the external affairs minister said, was taking India's civilizational ethos forward. He warned that global governance so far, that architecture had failed on several key aspects. Multilateralism is facing a crisis. It's one of the biggest challenges that the world faces. Whether it was it's issues of preventing war, that's where multilateralism has not succeeded. The prime minister also said that issues of global south need attention. The world must focus on it. Let's listen in to Prime Minister Narendra Modi. They are also the ones most affected by global warming caused by richer countries. This is why India's G20 presidency has tried to give a voice to the global south. No group can claim global leadership without listening to those most affected by its decisions. Excellencies, we are meeting at a time of deep global divisions. As foreign minister, it is but natural that your discussions are affected by the geopolitical tensions of the day. We all have our positions and our perspectives on how this tension should be resolved. Excellency, we must all acknowledge that multilateralism is in crisis today. The architecture of global governance created after the Second World War was to serve two functions. First, to prevent future wars by balancing competing interests. Second, to foster international cooperation on issues of common interests. The experience of the last few years, financial crisis, climate change, pandemic, terrorism, and wars clearly shows that global governance has failed. We have seen stable economies suddenly overwhelmed by debt and financial crisis. These experiences clearly show the need for resilience in our societies, in our economies, in our healthcare systems, and in our infrastructure. The G20 has a critical role to play in finding the right balance between growth and efficiency on one hand and resilience on the other. We can reach this balance more easily by working together. That is why your meeting is important. I have full trust in your collective wisdom and ability. I'm sure that today's meeting will be ambitious, inclusive, action-oriented, and will rise about differences. We must also admit that 
the tragic consequences of this failure are being faced most of all by the developing countries. After years of progress, we are at risk today of moving back on the sustainable development goals. Many developing countries are struggling with unsustainable debt while trying to ensure food and energy security for their people. So the Prime Minister's emphasis was very clearly that the voice of Global South must be heard. But are the voices of Global South not being heard or being held hostage to the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Joining me on the broadcast is Ambassador Meera Shankar, India's former ambassador to the United States of America, Ambassador Prabhu Dayal, and Ambassador V.B. Soni, India's former ambassador to Ukraine. Ambassador Meera Shankar, the Prime Minister's advice to all, all the G20 foreign ministers was that the voice of Global South needs to be heard. Your, according to you, ma'am, key takeaway is the voice of Global South being ignored by the developed countries? Well, I wouldn't say it's being ignored, but I think that divisions over Ukraine threaten to overwhelm the discussions in the G20, uh, which were really not meant to deal with security or geopolitical issues. Uh, they were really supposed to focus on reviving sustainable economic growth, uh, looking at sustainable development and climate change, looking at cooperation to address global pandemics. And there's a whole range of issues which were on the agenda of the G20 as priorities. And today we are seeing that the impact of the conflict in Ukraine has left economies, particularly in the developing world, reeling, trying to deal with the consequences of something that they had nothing to do with and are not really participating in. So fertilizer prices, food prices, energy prices, availability of energy, all these have become very serious issues for developing yes. countries. If you look at South Asia itself, you can see economies collapsing all around. Sri Lanka today still has 50% inflation and is trying to negotiate a loan with the IMF to deal with its uh, debt default, which uh, had taken place because they didn't have enough foreign exchange for and their yet the entire conversation from the Western countries, ma'am, appears yes. to be focused around the Russia-Ukraine conflict. So Ambassador Prabhu Dayal, is the West trying to hold Global South hostage to this Russia-Ukraine conflict? Is that what is happening? No, I think that the Russia-Ukraine conflict is the elephant in the room. Nobody wants to talk about it, but at the same time, it can't be ignored because it impacts all aspects of the global economy. There is a shortage of food, of energy. There is global inflation. There are lower demands of goods and services. Uh, there is the falling economic growth in the developing countries. But the problem is that all these factors are being impacted by the Russia-Ukraine war. And that is why our prime minister had to emphasize that India's G20 presidency is for the global south. The problems of the global south have to be attended to. They have to be given due attention. And that the Russia-Ukraine war, which is so divisive, should not be allowed to take the focus away from these issues. So you're right that the Russia-Ukraine war is coming in the way. It is not something that the G20 should be dealing with, because the G20, as you pointed out, 
is an economic organization. But nonetheless, the situation is such that this war is having a very devastating effect on the global economy and in particular on the countries of the global south. So are we to understand that unless the Russia-Ukraine war is addressed even on this platform, uh, you know, which isn't uh, a security platform, it's an economic platform, came out of an economic crisis, may, is meant to address economic issues, but that political issue or that conflict issue, Ambassador V.B. Sony, will continue to hold uh, the Global South hostage. Uh, where is that conversation uh, about food security or energy security or sustainable development uh, goals? Well, uh, it has been already brought out that the crisis has been hijacked because of a political agenda of the, of the Western world. They want us to take sides on their issues, which are of interest to them. But we are far removed from them, and we have absolutely no control over the situation over there. So what is happening is, the, as a result of the conflict, all other issues get sidelined. Issues which are bread butter issues, issues which are of great importance and which must be addressed um, uh, are pertaining to the global south. So India's attempt, therefore, is not to hijack the system, which is already taking a lot of time and energy and effort, and in fact is proving divisive. Issues at G20 should be a lot more global in nature. Now, it's a yes. regional conflict in terms, so far as we from the global south are concerned, but we are being asked to take side. Why should we take side? Because these are of no interest to us. They are not. I mean, they do not impact us except in a negative way. When yes. all the attention, all the resources, and all the policies are diverted to settling those personal scores. So, so, from an economic platform, then Ambassador Mira Shankar has this now become a political boxing ring and is it divided right down the middle for example uh, you know there is there is the western bloc and and the perhaps the russia china bloc and india is also being asked to choose take sides well i think india has to navigate very carefully and skillfully and it did this in bali so you have a template which created a consensus to deal with a very divisive issue. Now, both sides are, you know, wanting to improve the Bali statement from their perspective, which makes it very divisive. I think if pragmatism is to prevail, then, you know, you go back to the Bali template and put this issue aside and get on with the business of dealing with global challenges, which really are very serious at this point of time. To ignore them would be to do so at the peril of the peace and prosperity of the world. So, uh, and it also risks actually G20 uh, becoming either irrelevant or fragmenting in the long run, if we don't want this to happen, and it's in the interest of all countries not to have it happen, uh, because you can't have large economies outside the framework of the G20 and yet claim that it would have, you know, global significance or relevance, okay. then I think an effort has to be made from both sides. But then, uh, you know, the external affairs minister pointed consensus. that out, ma'am. Uh, and, and Ambassador Prabhudial, uh, if, I, if I could bring you in, sir, the external affairs minister pointed that out, that the two sides have taken such divergent views that it's, at least today or even in the finance minister's meet, they were unable to bridge the gap, bridge the divide. Does this appear then? This will continue because a lot has changed since Bali. Uh, Russia and China seem to be going back uh, even on the Bali declaration. Um, and does this then mean no communique, just this consensus uh, document. And what does this mean for the summit in September? Well, you're absolutely right in saying that there has been a hardening of the positions of the two rival blocs. Uh, there was a consensus reached in Bali, and India had put in a lot of efforts for making that possible. But last week, when the G20 finance ministers meeting ended in Bangalore, 
there was no joint communique. This indicated that with the Russia-Ukraine war now having continued for over a year, the two sides, the United States and the Western countries on one side, Russia and China on the other, both these sides have hardened their positions and therefore it will become very difficult to work out a joint communique. You are right in assessing that perhaps as we move on to the summit, the positions may harden even further. But of course, who knows what happens in global politics? Maybe there would be some resolution found to the war. Maybe it will end. But if it continues in this manner, and if the positions of the two rival sides continue to harden, then I think we are going in for very difficult times. You know, because the Prime Minister's word of advice uh, that multilateralism is, is under challenge, uh, the architecture so far, Ambassador Sony, they haven't been able to prevent wars. They haven't even been able to address issues of food and energy security. So, despite that, despite the fact that 27 foreign ministers attended uh, th this uh, foreign ministers meet, two ministers of state, there isn't a communique, there is a consensus document. Does this indicate India's... India not succeeding in uh, in being able to uh, to navigate this this minefield, or India tried. It's just that the positions are so hard. So be it. Well, you see, there are six more months left for this summit, and the purpose of having these uh, meetings of at the level of of foreign minister and of course finance ministers etc. Et is to find a way out. How do we go? Uh, there are a lot of uh, um, meetings on the sidelines. There are things which happen be uh, behind the scene. And that is exactly the tightrope walk which India has to undertake. And it has to undertake and we must not give in. We still have six months. It's not going to be easy. In all likelihood, it may not succeed. But that doesn't mean that they should, be, they should leave all the effort. I think India can possibly try to come up with some formula, some kind of a system with uh, a, a formula which can be acceptable to them. It has to continue. You cannot just leave, give it up like this. Today, it looks a little hopeless, but I would say that we must continue. The okay. effort must continue. Am Ambassador Shankar, Sincerity did it look hopeless continue. even to you? Uh, you know, when you heard the foreign minister's uh, press conference, uh, and before I come to that in, in just a moment, I want, I want our viewers to listen in to what the external affairs minister said about the G20 conversations that were happening and the efforts made by India. Uh, I met uh, Minister Chingang uh, uh, on the sidelines uh, of, the, of the conference this afternoon. Uh, it's our first meeting after he took over as uh, foreign minister. Uh, so uh, we spent, um, I don't know, maybe about 45 minutes uh, uh, talking to each other. There are uh, real problems in that relationship that need to be looked at, that need to be discussed very openly and candidly between us. Uh, that's what we uh, sought to do today. We also had a, a brief discussion on what was happening uh, in the G20 framework, uh, but uh, the, you know, the, the thrust of the meeting was really uh, on, on our bilateral relationship and the challenges in the bilateral relationship, especially that of peace and tranquility uh, in the border areas. Excellencies, let us remind ourselves that this grouping bears an exceptional responsibility. We first came together in the midst of a global crisis and are today, once again, actually confronting multiple ones. In considering these issues, we may not all always be of one mind. In fact, there are some matters of sharp differences of opinions and views. Yet, we must find common ground and provide direction because that is what the world expects of us. The world must also strive for more reliable and resilient supply chains. Recent experience has underlined the risks of being dependent on limited geographies. Ambassador Meera Shankar, is, 
is this your appreciation of the situation also that even the G20 is now sharply divided the western bloc and russia china uh, on 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 one side and there is very little common ground on any issue because of russia ukraine yes i think it is casting a shadow on the proceedings of the G20 and uh, uh, it would be in the interest of the world if the two sides could uh, set aside their differences for the time being or acknowledge them and keep them to a side and try to find common ground on the global challenges which uh, are of acute uh, nature and which really are the primary concerns of the rest of the world but since that is not happening ambassador dayal what's the way forward what's the road ahead uh, because what happened at the finance ministers meet uh, you know when you're looking for more funds for energy security for food security for sustainable development goals um, that doesn't seem to be happening either at the finance ministers meeting or the foreign ministers meeting the entire focus of the west remains condemn russia condemn russia the entire focus of russia um, uh, and and china remains to, uh, to stall this what next then well you know our prime minister has given the best possible advice during his address today at the g20 foreign ministers meeting he said that the divisive issues should be kept aside and the g20 should address the problems which it is supposed to address that is the economic issues he very categorically emphasized that the problems of the global south need attention because in this entire scenario the countries of the global south are suffering the most and that is why he underlined that the presidency of india's uh, over the g20 will highlight the problems of the global south and that perhaps is what needs to be done on the other hand if the world continues to be divided the way it is and that is reflected in the g20 deliberations then it will be difficult to find a way forward so is the g20 very clearly split wide open Am ambassador ambassador sony uh, this is a grouping that was meant for economic development it's now become a uh, a political or a diplomatic uh, boxing ring well it is obvious that the split has taken place but whether it's going to be permanent or is it just a, 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 a temporary situation as of now it doesn't look temporary but it has to be brought home the point has to be brought home to both sides i mean amount of uh, aid which was earlier given by the western countries on the one side and by the by the russians and the chinese to the african countries and those in asia so both of them are affected i mean china's uh, uh, obligations have also gre uh, uh, grown, gone up so much because of the you know what is happening in our neighborhood see uh, pakistan see sri lanka so that crisis is something which is going to affect not just the western countries but also the to to the, to the chinese and the russian so we have to come convey the message across that it is nobody's interest it's not in the interest of the developing world it's not the interest of the south southern world it's not in the interest either of the developed world and also the chinese world so the message has to be given and and india is the only country whose voice will be listened is that let aside set aside your current differences let's get to the real issues involved and we, uh, as it was mentioned earlier that those issues which divide us can be set aside at a later stage and then we will deal with that but that's a message that india has been constantly giving ambassador shankar uh, that message neither america nor europe nor russia and china seem to be getting that message are we looking at this very dangerous hardening of stance and is this then becoming cold war 2.0 well this is there is a hardening of stance because you know with a uh, russian offensive due to take place in ukraine and ukraine being armed with uh, more sophisticated weapons and likely to have its own uh, offensive uh, the conflict looks set to intensify over the next couple of months but uh, uh, clearly i think in diplomacy 
uh, we are used to patience and perseverance and both are required at this stage along with skill to try to keep the focus on issues which are important as ambassador soni said you know there's a quite some time till the summit there'll be many other meetings and hopefully by then we will be able to find a way to hammer out some consensus so let's very 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 good advice ma'am i hope that better sense prevails stay with me for a moment i need to slip into a quick break here because when you look at this hardening of stance on both sides uh, when you have the united states tell china do not give military hardware to russia you have china telling the united states do not give military hardware to taiwan what does this mean also what's happening at the bilateral the india china bilateral uh, between the foreign ministers of both these countries what did india say what does that mean that story and lots more coming up stay with us India Today Conclave 2023 March 17th and 18th New Delhi Listen to Janvi Kapoor Malaika Arora Anita Sen Gupta Abha Adams Hajar Chena Ramani Dr Ruha Shadab The India Moment common question that i've seen people deliberating so if you'd have the answer to that why should one choose ether why should one choose ether because that's that's the best that's the safest electric scooter right now on the market uh it's the most stable electric scooter right now on the market it's the one that's been uh built and researched for the longest period uh almost 10 years uh we started work on the scooter in 2014 Uh, shit, early 2013, late 2013, and we're here. What you see here is basically an outcome of all of that. How many more do you plan to sell? How? What's the market share that you're looking to capture? So I think uh, um, we have finally been able to scale up our production to about 35,000 units a month. That's on capacity. Our supply chain still is scaling up. Uh, it's now doing about 15, 16,000 units a month. Uh, and i'm confident of crossing about 25000 units 30 almost 25 30000 units a month by later this year uh, and fully utilizing this plant by either later this year or early next year uh, after that we will be production constrained again uh, and which point we will start working on new plant so so how does in years time we should utilize our full capacity so how does this translate into revenue and profitability by revenue i think uh, it will be outside of china it will be the uh, number one or number two electric two wheeler manufacturer uh, in a few months uh, globally uh, and by profitability i think uh, we are still some time away from being profitable while losses continue to narrow but given the pace at which market is increasing we have to continue investing in new capacity we have to continue investing in new charging infrastructure new product enhancements so i think uh, cash profitability is still i'd say not this year it's still a near to work voli painting a mural art form of maharashtra gives the rangabad a face lift ahead of a g20 inception meeting a group of 120 women painted non stop for 6 hours to complete the artwork women empowerment show karte hue hum log ye jo project kar rahe hai warli ka world's largest warli painting jo hai jiska record pehle pune mein tha usko pune ke record ko break karte hue usko challenge karte hue aaj hum sab ladkiya we are 120 uh, ladies here working for this warli painting today और इसका सबसे बड़ा क्रेडिट जो जाता है जो मेरी बहुत अच्छी फ्रेंड है वो है नंदिनी घोड़ेले ये कॉन्सेप्ट जो जहाँ से आई है 
वो लड़की ने सर 21 इयर्स की लड़की है दिस इज रियली अ मोटिवेशन टू ऑल द गर्ल्स ओवर हियर द वर्क स्प्रेड ओवर 3200 स्क्वायर फीट विल एंटर द इंडिया बुक ऑफ रिकॉर्ड्स 2024 इन द सोशल एंड कल्चरल कैटेगरी This painting breaks the earlier record of 3050 square feet set by artists in Pune. I congratulate all the dignitaries those who have taken uh, efforts jinhone is event ko ek successful banaya hai and congratulations to Aurangabad Municipal Corporation. There were no professional artists among the 120 participants. They came from different professions like medicine, accountancy, and engineering. Bureau report, India Today. Make your media plans smarter with India Today Live TV on your connected devices. Amplify your brand with 100 million smart internet viewers. To advertise, mail us at sales at ajtag.com. And a major development on the sidelines of the G20 foreign ministers meet. India, of course, is holding this biggest ever G20 foreign ministers meet. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jay Shankar held a bilateral meeting with his Chinese counterpart. The first since Xi Jinping came back for a third term. Now, this bilateral meeting comes amidst an ongoing border tension between India and China. at the line of actual control and soon after this meeting the external affairs minister talked about india reiterating its stance moving forward depended on peace and tranquility along the borders let's listen in to the external affairs minister uh, i met uh, minister chingang uh, uh, on the sidelines uh, of the of the conference this afternoon uh it's our first meeting after he took over as uh, foreign minister uh so uh we spent um, i don't know maybe about 45 minutes uh, uh talking to each other there are uh, real problems in that relationship that need to be looked at that need to be discussed very openly and candidly between us uh, that's what we uh, sought to do today we also had a, a brief discussion on what was happening uh, in the g20 framework uh, but uh, the you know the the thrust of the meeting was really uh, on on our bilateral relationship and the challenges in the bilateral relationship especially that of peace and tranquility uh, in the border areas ambassador dayal how do you view this the fact that the chinese foreign minister came to india of course for the g20 but there was a bilateral and india reiterated peace and tranquility at the borders very essential what how would you view this well gorav first of all let me state that the india china relationship is currently at its lowest point in six decades now India and China have withdrawn troops from the two banks of the Pangong Lake, Gogra and Hot Springs. However, they have not been able to make progress in other crucial friction points such as Debsang and Demchok. Now, the Chinese side has been saying that this border tension should be put aside or put away in an appropriate place while relations are taken forward in other areas such as trade. on our part india has 
emphasized that the only disengagement of the frontline troops from the LDC and the restoration of peace and tranquility is what India wants. And India emphasizes that this alone can lead to the normalization of bilateral relations. So there is a big difference in the positions taken by the two sides. And in that okay. context, this meeting between our external affairs minister and the Chinese foreign minister assumed a lot of significance. Okay. Ambassador Sony, the fact that China and Russia would want India um, to to perhaps not be uh, in the Western camp when it comes to Russia-Ukraine. At the same time, there's border tension between India and China. Where does that leave us and where does that leave China? Well, first of all, uh, China and Russia, if they think that India can be weaned away so easily, it can't be done like that. Uh, we have uh, certainly uh, empathy for Russia, but with China... For to expect us to do anything on that, they have to take some steps. They haven't really taken any steps. As uh, my colleague just now mentioned, this is the lowest point of our relationship with China because there is nothing moving forward. In fact, there is a hardening of position by their side on the border issues. There are certain agree issues which they agree on and they renege, they go back on that. So as Russia is concerned, I don't think we could have done more than what we have done for Russia. They have been a very good friend for us for the last decades. So we have not abandoned them. At the same time, we have also conveyed to them that the move, the way forward is not just to take the stance which they have taken, which is very hard and stand. They have to realize the world has moved on. They can't possibly be guided by what was happening in the past. So they have to show some consideration, some kind of uh, step forward. They okay. have not done so far. So which they haven't is, done so far. Uh, and, and India, of course, continues to maintain, and so does China, of course, more than 50,000 troops at the line of actual control. But at the G20, Russia hit out at the Western countries. The Russia-Ukraine conflict remained the biggest elephant in the room at the G20 foreign ministers' meet. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar held a meeting with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, he is one of the key aides of Russian President Vladimir Putin, considered virtually his right-hand man. Now, in his briefing, Sergei Lavrov not only appreciated India's role, he spoke highly of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's role in governance amidst this Russia-Ukraine war, but he hit out at the Western Bloc. Lavrov claimed it was the West, especially the United States and the United Kingdom, who were trying to derail peace talks between Russia and Ukraine. Let's listen in. You know, is the conflict uh, impacting uh, the global south? Of course it is. Uh, but, uh, it's, not, it's not something new. In fact, we, India has been saying this very strongly for uh, pretty much close to a year uh, that, uh, you know, this is uh, affecting, uh, in fact, uh, today in my own session, I actually use the word saying for much of the global south, this is a make or break issue that the cost of fuel, the cost of food, the cost of fertilizer, the availability of fertilizer, which means next year's food, uh, these are all extremely pressing issues. And if you see some of the, uh, uh, some of the countries who were already struggling with debt, who were already impacted by the pandemic, uh, for them, uh, the, this conflict, the knock-on effects of this conflict coming on top of that, uh, has been really, uh, I mean, damaging is a very, very mild word. Today, when addressing the participants of the foreign minister meeting President Modi, I think he presented balanced and responsible position of the country as the president of the G20. And in this address, he was not just speaking about some isolated individual situation because the West is trying to divide the geopolitical picture into individual episodes. But in the address by Mr. Modi, he gave the assessment of the situation across the globe. So India continues to negotiate. India continues to be the voice of the global south the developing countries and let's see if the Western Bloc 
listens to developing countries on this very crucial aspect, whether it's energy security or food security or sustainable development goals. And we'll be tracking that story very closely. Ambassador Meera Shankar, Ambassador Prabhu Dayal and Ambassador V.B. Soni for joining me here on this India Today special. Many thanks. A quick break. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is at the Raisina Dialogue with Giorgia Meloni, the Prime Minister of Italy. This is the 75th year of India-Italy relations. But before that, coming up next, it's the big BJP win in Tripura and in Nagaland with Alliance Partners. These are images that you see of celebrations that are taking place in Tripura. But what about Meghalaya? Will there be a consensus, uh, will there be a coalition government once again with the NPP, with Conrad Sangma in, in uh, Sangma in Meghalaya? That story and lots more coming up. Stay with us. from yet another day at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. Now, quick weather update. It's gotten much better outside. Sunny days are here in Barcelona, less chilly, but it's the opposite story inside the FIRA here at the Mobile World Congress. A lot of the launches have already happened. So that excitement, that anxiety, that trepidation has sort of fizzled out here at MWC Barcelona when I speak to some of the CEOs and some of the C-suite executives uh, exclusively for business today. We found out that a lot of that action has been happening behind closed doors. And some of the biggest customer engagements, partnerships are all taking place here at MWC because this is a big one. It's back after a long hiatus with such scale and at such a scale here in Barcelona. There's nearly 80,000 attendees, several exhibitors, of course, a lot of them coming from China and the US as well. So this has become a true meeting ground for all tech enthusiasts and for the tech business at large. Now, in terms of things that we've seen over here, we've seen a bunch of phones and a bunch of launches like the Xiaomi 13 Pro, the Realme fast charging device, a OnePlus concept device, which I'm not quite sure will ever be a reality, but let's see about that. But the real showstopper over the course of the past few days has been at this stall, the Motorola stall. It's the Moto Riser concept. Absolutely mind-blowing tech. Imagine rollable tech in the palm of your hand. We can only hope that this becomes a reality very soon. We showed it to you exclusively on the first day and of course on our social media channels. But now we have an exclusive hands-on with the device. Have a look. The Motorola Riser concept that we hope will soon be a reality. What makes this phone really special is the minute you give it a double tap on that side, the rollable display now expands to this. Tap it twice again. And like that, just like magic, it's back to this traditional form. Now, there's a lot of use cases for something like this. I think rollable displays are something which will work in the future. We've seen how foldables are really hotting up as a space, even in India and on tech today. We've seen the Oppo Find N2 Flip and the Samsung Galaxy Flip 4, the Fold. There's all sorts of devices here at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona, but we have this concept phone in the flesh on tech today. There's also a few other things that this phone can do. For instance, if you flick it twice like this, and now it's just, well, the rear camera, and I want to suddenly start using the front camera. And there you go, I flick it again, and here's the front camera. And if you notice, when I did that, this display was untouched. It rolled further out there, the camera's revealed, as is the earpiece. You flick it back again, and there you go. So I think in general, there is obviously much more digital advertising happening. And, um, you know, the platforms are becoming more active and influencers are becoming more active because we do feel that this is going to shape advertising in the future uh, in a very, very big way. 
So uh, more than I would say, you know, has it gone up or down because the guidelines are very recent. I think what we can say is that just at an anecdotal basis, we are seeing a lot more influencers who are compliant. We are seeing the hashtags being used. We are seeing the paid partnership tags being used. So I think that's a great step. Uh, and we are definitely seeing more platforms also bringing in disclosure labels so that there is a native way to kind of uh, disclose uh, your material connection. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, influencers are taking this whole thing, I feel, in, in a really good way, in a very positive way. Uh, and using disclosure, you know, not with any kind of uh, pressure, but I think as a voluntary choice that they are making. And I think that is really, really great news. Absolutely. Like you said, there's been a rise in digital ads, digital influencing marketing is the newest thing on the block. Where do you think this will go? Will it take over the revenue, the ad spends that we saw for TV ads? Will, it, will digital advertising be the biggest advertising field in ad? Um, if you see the growth that it has, I mean, you know, it's already kind of inching towards uh, television growth. So television still remains the largest, but digital is now a close second. Um, and the rate of growth of digital is definitely higher. So I think, uh, you know, I think all media will continue to grow. So it's not as if, um, you know, that you will actually see a decline in any particular medium. But yes, I think just in terms of percentage split, uh, I feel that digital would is likely to take over television in the next few years. Filmmakers in the Indian film industry have often resorted to remaking successful films in the hopes that audiences would flock to a theater. However, recent releases such as Karthik Arya's Shehzada and Akshay Kumar and Imran Hashmi's Star as Selfie, which are also remakes of Alu Arjun's Alavai Kuntu Puramalo and Prithviraj Sukumar and Star Driving License, have turned out to be box office duds. And cinephiles will be hoping that this could bring an end to the remake culture in Bollywood. The box office success of several big budget films in Bollywood has been on shaky ground, with audiences rejecting remakes of South and Hollywood movies lately, and the Hindi film industry losing its grip on the audience due to the lack of originality. Let's take a look at some disastrous Hindi remakes which tanked. Hrithik Roshan and Saif Ali Khan collaborated with filmmaker duo Pushkar Gayatri for the Bollywood version of the Tamil hit Vikram Veda. The film, which was made on a massive budget of 175 crore rupees, approximately grossed over 78 crores to the box office. Whereas R. Madhavan and Vijay Sethupati starrer's Lifetime Collection was over 58 crore rupees at the box office, but was made on a relatively lower budget. Amir Khan and Karina Kapoor Khan starrer Lal Singh Chadha crashed out of theatres with a lifetime collection of 58 crores approximately in its domestic run. The film was a remake of Tom Hanks's hit film Forrest Gump. When our father was in the last stage of cancer and he was not ready to give the medical money without the money, we had to take the opportunity. The Akshay Kumar and Kriti Sanan Stara, which is a remake of the 2014 Tamil film Jigar Tanda, turned out to be a box office dud and ended up collecting over 72 crores. Reportedly, the film was made on a budget of 180 crore rupees and was panned by critics. Godfather <laughs> Godfather. 
After Kabir Singh, Shahid Kapoor picked yet another Telugu film for a remake. Shahid Kapoor's sports drama Jersey ended up doing poor business at the box office with a lifetime collection of 19 crore rupees, approximately, despite good reviews. The Telugu version, meanwhile, collected over 50 crores. <laughs> हम मिडिल क्लास फैमिली की लाइफ ही प्रॉब्लम है लेकिन जब प्रॉब्लम फैमिली पे आती है ना तो एक निकम्मा ही काम आता है from poor reviews to a low box office collection of approximately 1.5 crores, the Shilpa Shetty, Abhimanyu Dasani and Shirley Setia starrer washed out from theatres within a few days of its release. The film was a remake of Nani's Telugu flick, Middle Class Abai, which had collected over 69 crores. With Slikda Shweta, Entertainment Bureau, India Today. Tragedies can either break you or make you. And this story from Naxal hit Gachiroli will inspire you in many ways. Bharati Bogami was just 17 when her father, the Sarpanch of Lahiri village, was shot dead by Naxals in 2002. A brain tumor survivor, she faced several financial problems and yet continued her struggle to become a doctor. She now serves in the same area where her father was killed. मैं सोच रही थी अब तो पापा चले गए आज ये सब होने के बाद अगर मैं अगर यही मेरा फ्यूचर अगर मैं पेपर ना दूं तो आगे कैसे बढूं मेरे पापा की ख्वाहिश थी कि मैं मुझे बचपन से मुझे बोलते थे नर्स बोलते थे डॉक्टर बोलते थे ऐसे मुझे अच्छा लगता था पढ़ाई पूरी होने के बाद मैंने सोच लिया या तो सब सिटी में रहकर सब लोगों को तो डॉक्टर है लेकिन मेरे गांव को मेरे लोगों की बहुत जरूरत मेरे दिल में ऐसे कुछ तो भी चुभने से लग रही थी कि अपने गांव जाके मैं सेवा दूं इसीलिए फिर मैं रिटर्न आ गई Bogami found a life and work partner in Satish, who moved from Bead to the tribal area only to support her dream of serving her village. मेरी जो बीवी है उसने मुझे मोटिवेट किया कि उन्होंने मुझे ये बताया कि डॉक्टर प्रकाश आमते, डॉक्टर मंदा किन्हीं आमते, डॉक्टर दिगान You are watching India today. Saffron flag rises again in Northeast. BJP and its allies retain Tripura and Nagaland. Conrad Sangma and BJP to join hands. Celebration erupts in BJP. Prime Minister Modi to give victory speech. Our top focus at 7 p.m. Prime. Our top focus at 7 p.m. Good evening, viewers. Uh, what a day it's been. Two big headlines coming in at the day at the hustings. Uh, well, with all that had gone down, with all the kind of speculation that was made, uh, finally, BJP has retained Tripura emphatically at that. Uh, right now, with what we're getting to understand, 32 seats is what the numbers have firmed up on. And the BJP is home with its ally IPFT, which is on just one seat that the IPFT has won. So the BJP has practically done it on its own. On the other hand, the other big headline that's emerging, and that is Conrad Sangma. 25 seats. Who would have expected the NPP, who decided to go alone in Meghalaya, has uh, delivered an emphatic win is five short of uh, the magic figure which is 30th already Conrad Sagma has asked for the help of the Bharatiya Janata Party which is uh, he's called up Amit Shah asking him uh, his support which is the BJP support the BJP right now stands at three seats which have been confirmed uh, one that they're still leading on so with all that went down which was an acrimonious campaign with the you know, with even the Prime Minister's uh, helicopter not landing in Meghalaya. On the other hand, the BJP going all out to attack the NPP and Conrad uh, Sangma calling him a dynast, calling him corrupt. All that 
is water under the bridge and uh, old friends turn four are now friends again in terms when it comes down to politics. So the BJP in, will form government in Tripura in governance in both Nagaland and Meghalaya. We're going to get you the latest first up the headlines. BJP and ally IPFT set to form government in Tripura. BJP leads in 34 seats, left in Congress lead in 14 and Tipra Mota lead in 11. BJP NDPP near two-third majority in Nagaland. BJP set to form government with Conrad Sangma NPP in Meghalaya. India leads the global south at G20, says Ukraine war a make or break issue. Russia slams West hypocrisy. External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar and Chinese counterpart hold talks on LAC peace. Top court order SEBI probe on manipulations of stock prices in Adani Hindenburg case, says report to expert panel within two months. Adani welcomes move, says truth will prevail. And massive news coming in from the top court on appointments of election commission chief says the chief election commission must be appointed like the CBI chief. Uh, the panel needs to be transparent of prime minister, leader of opposition and the chief justice of India must appoint the CEC. Bulldozer's roll into Prayag Raj for the second straight day. Another house uh, linked to Umesh Pal murder accused. Raised the house belongs to gangster turned neta Atik Ahmad's aid. All right, let's take you directly right now to the visuals that are coming in from the BJP headquarters at uh, Deen Dayal Upadhyay Mark. You have JP Nadda there uh, interacting with the leaders there. It's uh, celebratory uh, moments for the BJP. Understandably, viewers, this is classic BJP playbook celebrations. The dust settles through the course of the day at the hustings. They've done exceedingly well in Tripura. They're going to form government in Tripura. Even with three seats in Meghalaya, they're going to be part of governance and uh, they've come to power with their alliance in Nagaland. So in all three states, if not forming the government, they're going to be part of the governance process. And celebrations now where the headquarters of BJP in the national capital are concerned. JP Nadda, party president, coming in. In a short while, you'll also see the Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, coming in as well. Piyush Goel, welcoming JP Nadda. Aishwarya, uh, over to you. Can you take us through all the optics that are coming in from the BJP headquarters? <laughs> Well, Priti, you know, let me start by showing you the enthusiasm that the women have over here. We have been seeing how they all have... Modi, 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 You know, the slogan is... Modi, 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 Okay, you know, optics of on full show here. The lady is wearing yellow, and there's also a lotus on the sari. So you know, one can see the kind of enthusiasm uh, that's uh, really palpable here at the BJP headquarters. You know, the women are sitting on the entire stairs, Preeti, and all of them. And you intezar kar rahe Prime Minister Narendra. Hamji. Unko dekhke hi jayenge. Bilkul bilkul. Har saal, har baar vijay hone pa hum yahan aate hain, jashan banate hain aur Modi ji se jaro milke jaate hain. Modi ji ko kya kya hai? Hai toh na chotis ki, abhi se, abhi se sahi dete hain Modi ji ko. 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 Modi ji ko.
So the enthusiasm of Priti obviously is very palpable here. One can see, uh, you know, the chants are going louder by the minute, Priti, and they are now enthusiastically waiting for Prime Minister Narendra Modi to reach the venue. Some of them even wearing the colors of the Bharatiya Janata Party, the yellow color, and also showing the lotus uh, that they are carrying with them, Priti. What's the timeline? Because we're given to understand, Aishwarya, that the Prime Minister is stuck at the Raisina dialogue. He's only going to make his way to the BJP headquarters. It's been uh, quite a day of heavy lifting by the Prime Minister himself. Possibly, if he does make a speech uh, at the BJP headquarters and we are expecting him to make one, I guess, uh, it's going to be his third speech of the day. Well, it should be around age 8.30, uh, you know, Preeti, that's what we are made to understand here at the moment. Uh, once the rise in our dialogues are over, that's when Prime Minister will make his way. But, you know, I'll just show you around, Preeti, uh, you know, the kind of enthusiasm that one sees. Uh, one of the very interesting things that I can show you here is, uh, you know, uh, this Lord Hanuman uh, that, you know, one can see here, the lotus on the head, Prime Minister's photo on the other side, uh, you know, the lotus here, Prime Minister on the lotus. So, the colour, you know, Preeti, in fact, let me show you because it's so close to Holi. Uh, you know, some people have started playing Holi here. So, that's the kind of enthusiasm that very palpable here at the beach. Ashwara, where are we expecting the Prime Minister? Preeti, some people have started playing Holi here. Preeti, we are expecting the Prime Minister by around 8 o'clock. That's what we are made to understand here at the BJP headquarters at at around 8, 8.15 is when the Prime Minister will be reaching the Bharti Janta Party headquarters. Preeti. All right, well, uh, it's a dream run where uh, it's come for the BJP viewers. After Gujarat, it's a fabulous day at the hustings for the Bharatiya Janta Party. Primarily, uh, you know, if you look at what has gone down in Tripura, Tripura, it was 2013, 2% or a little even less than 2% vote share is what the Bharatiya Janata Party had. Dramatic rise to a 44% uh, taking away the entire uh, vote base of the Congress Party. It was an acid test or trial by fire for the BJP. Many had called this an inorganic growth and uh, questioned whether the BJP would be able to hold on to its vote base. And yes, it has. Uh, and uh, of course, not maybe the 44 that it had the last time around in 2018, but a comfortable 32 and a 31 of its own accord. So the BJP, even without the IPFT, its ally in Tripura has sailed home comfortably passing the halfway mark. Uh, so very, very comfortable there where Meghalaya comes into question. Um, the 